and I meant to have the share open when I did that because I liked it. I like that to be the first thing on the screen, but I forgot to. Um, okay, there. Today we're starting the book of Galatians. I, I want to admit a failure or a flop. Um, my my idea of trying to operate two agendas and to have a faith talk to component, I found to be awkward and discouraging, and so I decided to kill it. <laughs> uh, instead, instead of trying to run two agendas, I'm just going to suggest that we allow a stretchable agenda. Awesome. If if something comes up in the course of a conversation and we think it needs more time, then we simply take more time. If we run to the end of the hour, we say, well, it's like we're going to have to pick this up next week. That's fine. I will try to, to communicate that to the office so that somehow the parish notes make sense. Um, I, I don't want people who might drop in, although it doesn't happen very often, somebody drops in to, to not be informed about what we're talking about. So I, if I can, I will keep the Paris notes and the newsletter as, as accurate as possible. But I'm not gonna let that control what goes on. If, if we need more time, we take it. Just that simple. That's a good word, stretchable. Stre a stretchable agenda. We know we, we, for example, right now, we know we wanna read the book of Galatians, but we have not committed to it. Just because there are six chapters in the book of Galatians doesn't mean that we're going to take six weeks to do this. Yeah. It might take it, more. It might take more. Yeah. Right. So, and if you just in the newsletter said that we were studying, starting this week, the study of Galatians. Yeah. yeah. And that's essentially what I That's think. all you have to do. That's, I, think, I think that's what I Continue it and then you don't have to really adjust it. So, that, so that's the uh, reason I'm not starting with Faith Talk 2 today. Now, I was just informed, uh, I sent, those of you who get my weekly email, I, I sent you the wrong document. I will send you this document, it's the one that's on the table, uh, a little bit later today, I'll, I'll get it out. But what I sent you is actually a wonderful thing for you to have, and I, and I encourage you to read it. Yeah. Uh, Martin Luther's Commentary on the book of Galatians. The whole commentary? So I sent the whole commentary. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't read the whole thing. thing. I skipped it, and I thought, this is really cool okay. stuff. Well, yeah. now, a couple things about it. The, the one that you read is, is, a, is a relatively, relatively recent uh, translation. It was, in, it was in the 30s. 30s, 90 yeah. years. Yeah, it's hundred years. It's almost hundred years, but it's out of copyright. That's why it's available yeah. free. Okay, but I liked the guy's description of what he was doing. He agreed to translate it if he could speak American, not Elizabethan English. You know, most at that time, I guess most people were still holding on to the King James language, and and it just sounded very Victorian and whatever. Yeah. And so he, he said, I'll, I'll do the translation, but I want to speak like an American. So for example, the, the, where I first noticed it was uh, Luther is talking about executions and you'd think he would be, he would say the, the noose. And he does include the noose, but he also includes the electric chair. <laughs> I said, no, Luther never said electric chair because he didn't, there was no electric yeah. concept, right. let, let alone an, an execution device. Yeah. So th this guy, it, it's written, it is a translation, but it's it's modernized. It, so it, it reads very easily to the American ear, Okay. Um, I think. Um, and also what you'll find in there is Luther jumps back and forth without telling you what he's talking about. At one point, he's talking about Paul and the Galatians. And the next minute, he's talking about Luther in the Reformation in uh -huh. Germany, dealing with the Calvinists or the Pope. Mm -hmm. he, just, he just jumps back and forth. He chooses, he chooses whatever's going on in the Galatians story to amplify what's going on in the Reformation. So it's it's interesting read. I 
I have read it several times in preparation for this. Um, now, um, yeah, particularly about the beginning part of it, who's called? Pardon? The calling. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't. Well, in the beginning of Galatians, where. Oh, he's called <laughs> as an apostle. apostle. Oh, oh, I, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, we're, we're, let's, let's get to that. I, I wanted to say something. And, I, and so in the document that you didn't read, I include two paragraphs from my online, no, not online, it's it's the commentary I have on my electronic computer, on my electronic Bible. Um, to, just to give you a quick summary of what's going on, uh, two other things you can, to, to see what's going on, notice the end of chapter one and part of chapter two of Galatians. Paul is recounting some of the story. And also, if you go to the book of Acts, chapter 9, you can see the story from that, from, from Luke. Luke wrote Acts, and he's telling you the story of what happened about Paul. And, and so that, that's how these two books go, go together. The essence, of, the essence of the story is uh, Paul went out to the Gentiles after his conversion. And we call it the first missionary journey. And he planted churches. I, I don't know how long he stayed in a given place, but, but picture a farmer going along and well, planting's a good word because he, he didn't stay very long. He got a church started, he appointed leaders, and then he moved to the next town. I'm not saying he didn't preach to them, but it, it was a fast process. The Holy Spirit contributed to this process. Okay, he blasts through southern Turkey, creates, we're not told exactly which cities, but it's the Galatia, a lot of cities. He plants churches. In other words, Galatians is it a region. It's, it's a, that's true. It is a region in southern Turkey. <laughs> Modern day work. And um, so it'd be like a letter to the Pennsylvanians. Yeah, it's a big enough area. Yeah, it's a big area. Uh, not just the people who live in Philadelphia or mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, it's, it's the region. Okay, the problem was almost immediately after he planted those churches, along comes uh, another group of preachers who say, well, we're from the real apostles <laughs> down in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. This guy, Paul, is misleading. He is not really even an apostle. He wasn't with us. They claimed to have been eyewitnesses. So they were, remember when Jesus walked around, there were the 12 disciples. But there was also greater and greater groups of people surrounding. More than the 12 followed. More than just the 12. So these guys were saying, we saw him. Maybe we even saw him resurrected. And he is not preaching the right gospel. The gospel we have learned from the real apostles in Jerusalem require you to be, the essential argument is you have to be a Jew first. Yeah. If you want to be a Christian, you have to be a Jew. And just so you you know, ladies, this does involve you, even though technically the circumcision argument really <laughs> only falls on I men. Do. But it, it's it's more than just circumcision. It's all of the law, all the moral oh and and family life law, civil law. How many of you like cheeseburgers? <laughs> give give it up. You can't have a cheeseburger yeah. because you can't put the the cheese and the the meat together, together, and you can't encompass that in a in bread. That's all a violation. Cheeseburgers are against the law of God. That's just not one. kosher. That's not that, that's not a kosher. So now, did Jesus do? I think, did Jesus do away with all those laws? Well, that's the idea. Yes. 
Do you remember Jesus? Uh, I can't come on. Tim has to give me the chapter and verse. What co what goes into a person does not make him unclean. Mm -hmm. Only what comes out of the heart makes someone unclean. That's Jesus' teaching, and so. So when now when he dies, is that all change? Uh, I mean, no, no, that doesn't change. That Jesus said the law is it does not apply anymore. No, no. It does not make you unclean no. to eat a cheeseburger. When did that take effect? I mean, when did it take effect? Oh, well. When he died? Or, I thought that there's was two it. answers. Yes, thank you. That's, that's actually a good question. When, when, when it took effect? The change in the law. Jesus said there is no cleanliness law for us. Oh. Okay. Now, be careful. We, we don't say that all laws are abrogated. The first one. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart. That one still applies. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're, we're talking about the, the ceremonial and the kosher laws. They're not talking about the Ten Commandments. Is that That's one? right. Now, th those are those are different in that Jesus, uh, he didn't abrogate them. He fulfilled them. But in the case of the ceremonial and the, and the ceremonial laws are gone, not because Jesus said, do away with them but because he fulfilled them. He is the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect sacrifice. Why would you ever need to sacrifice again? Yeah. The food laws are abrogated because Jesus specifically said, don't worry about this. You can't eat something to make yourself unclean. So if Jesus said that, it's done. done now, so when does this all happen? I would say the food laws were abrogated when he said it. Mm. The ceremonial laws were abrogated when he fulfilled them on the cross. So when he, once his sacrifice happened, there's no need I for I thought maybe he fulfilled them on the cross, and that's why. What is it? I thought it took into effect when he was on the cross when he said that. Well, what, what took effect? I mean the I mean the food laws. Well, but see, he said it. The moment he says that, I think that's when that food law rule applies. Um, but you're, it, we, we don't really know. We, we have no evidence in the scripture whether the disciples started eating pork, <laughs> you know, immediately. I, I doubt it For, because this whole book exists. Obviously, the disciples clung on to their Jewishness. Well, why, why was it unclean before and then it became clean after, after he died? Because he said it. Yeah. I think. I think I read something on that, and they said in in prior times they had some of these laws because it was unsafe back in that time. Of That's, I've seen that explanation too. Why did yeah. God even have all these kosher? Why why does it what does it matter if the animal has clothes or it's shellfish? I think yeah. the way they cut back then. And, and so it, it, it is back then. It was it is possible. That that it was some sort of well, health. Heard it from you. Yeah. No, I don't think I'm not sure. I, I don't think I've ever talked about this. It might have been a health concern. Yeah, back in the day. But but it also could have just been keep different. Other culture, uh, just so your culture is different from yeah. others. I'm going to give you a rule, and it's it's not really a health benefit. It's just I want you to be different from the Hittites mm. or whatever. Mm. Cultural thing. We don't really know. Yeah. Um, now, what's wrong with shellfish? I like shellfish. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I heard about, I mean, the shellfish, they eat all the garbage of the ocean. Yeah. I heard that. They're bottom feeders. That, that's right. That's why I, I love crabs, but crabs eat the most <laughs> awful stuff. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that, that's the introduction. And as I said, if you want more introduction, notice that the second half of chapter one has all explaining what was going on and then also a little bit in chapter two and then you can go to acts chapter nine. but let's get let's get to the actual verses and i'm going to do something a little different starting in paul chapter one i'm sorry in galatians paul says and i'm going to read it first now i've got it broken up here as i often do i've got questions running down the right hand side but I'm going to go a different way with this document. I have another document behind the scenes. So just let me read the whole. I'm going to read Galatians 
chapter 1, 1 to 5, just the first five verses. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, not by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me, to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of God, God and of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, that's Paul's uh, salutation, introduction. Yeah. And I already said that Paul was angry with what was going on in Galatians because these guys came from Jerusalem and they were teaching something that he describes as another gospel. So it, I, it occurred to me that we should spend some time talking about what the gospel is. So find this document, you, you don't have it. I'm, I think this is what I'm looking for. Yes. So if I were to ask you, now we know Paul is having trouble with people misrepresenting the gospel. So to get our minds around the problem, I thought we'd be, we'd be wise to spend a little bit of time. What is the gospel? What would make Paul so upset? Uh, now, I, we, can, we, we will get to the point of what was the false gospel. But let's, let's work with what the real gospel is. What's the heart of the matter for us? <clears throat> so, Think, you know, you're in Sunday school. The teacher says, what is the gospel? Good Sunday school answer. Words spoken by Jesus Christ. Words spoken by Jesus Christ. Yeah, but gospel is the good news. So the good there you news go. There, there's, there's the words I was looking for. Good so good news. That is, I think that's the literal translation right. of the word. Yeah, gospel. well, that is. Yeah, yeah, and the good uh, news is the forgiveness of sins. Aha! So we've got we've got words spoken by Jesus. Uh, come back to that in a second. Good news, and in particular, forgiveness of sins. Now, it does. It is true that Jesus does using his words forgives people. He just says it. He forgives the guy with the shriveled hand. He forgives the woman caught in adultery. He forgives. But there's more to the gospel story than just that, right? How, how does he forgive? How is he able? Now, now that's not a good way to ask it because he's God. He can he can forgive her. That's kind of an easy answer. Yeah. So like he, he's, 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 you're like asking about the rationale. Well, he's, well, he's, he's, okay. It's not that easy because God demands holiness. But Bonnie has added the grace through faith yeah. that we keep keep a, keep on our Lutheran track. Okay, that's that's fine. Okay. Uh, what, what not by saying? works of the law. Okay. Uh, it's also the new covenant, right? It's a departure from the Old Testament to the new. Yeah, now we use that term in communion. So picture the words. This is the blood of the new covenant. This is my blood. Right. So that's why I was saying forgiveness actually cost Jesus' life. Yeah. He died. There is no remission of sin without the blood. shedding of blood. So, so we, so yes, it's forgiveness of sins, and it's it's declared by the gospels, but but uh, but there's the explanation for how it's how it's done. Yes, it's 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 a sacrificial piece that substitution. might make us okay. We also use the word substitutionary atonement. Mm -hmm. We are right with God. Okay. Um. 
That's why in the Old Testament, they had to keep doing it, keep doing the sacrifices yeah. with the animals. In this document, I left space just so that I could scroll. Did you order to the sacrifice? No. They had a problem. They, they, <laughs> the, the problem wasn't Jesus. Um, the problem was the Romans destroying the temple. In AD 70, the, the, the temple is destroyed. And in their system, they have to stop sacrifices. They, they, now, well, how about the temples around here? Well, those aren't, they may still call them temples. They also may call them synagogues. But that, that is not the temple in Jerusalem. That's the only place. If you read the Old oh. Testament story where, where God promises his presence in the temple, and that's where the people are to make their sacrifices. There were debates and arguments all through their history mm. about people trying to put up altars in all different on hill, different hillsides. Remember the Samaritans? Yeah, yeah, right. They got in trouble because they they were worshiping on Mount Aaron, Hebron. Um, I'm getting the name wrong, Haram or something. There's another mountain in Samaria where they they worshipped. They they thought they were doing a good thing. Uh, the Jews said, no, that's an abomination. You can't worship anywhere else than Jerusalem. So once the Romans come along and destroy the temple, there's, there's no there's no sacrifice. Why, do why don't they still do sacrifices? At the I don't know why they can't. Well, I mean, I, I would think they'd come up with a solution, but but obviously they've decided well, that they can live their life without the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. How do they atone for sin? I have. There's a, still the Day of Atonement. Isn't it called Yom Kippur? Yeah. yeah. Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. uh, so they do, still do it. They just don't do it with, uh, and by the way, they don't sacrifice in their own backyard either. <laughs> they, I mean, this, this is not something you do on your own. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, we would have to have a Jew explain to us, we understand why you can't sacrifice in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. but, but Where's that content now? All that forgiveness that was flowing from the sacrificial system. Hmm. We put it on Jesus. But of, short, of course, they're not going to put it on Jesus. Anyway, hmm. so here's what is the gospel. I answered. I'm scrolling. Here's my answers. Um, let, me, let me change the... Uh, Sorry, okay. Uh, it, one, one thing that occurred to me, uh, the John 3.16 is always uh, called the gospel in miniature. I didn't, I probably should have shown all the text, but I, dot, dot, dot. I, you all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Yeah. That's John 3.16. Probably the first Bible verse anybody memorizes. Um, now, I... I said, notice the third line down, add, um, one way to express the gospel is the physical elements of the, the life and task of Jesus. So if, if I was going to describe what is the gospel, Jesus Christ is the gospel, the person of Jesus. What do I mean by that? Well, there it is. True God, true man, lived, suffered, and died, and rose for our salvation. That would be my quick one sentence gospel. Finally, Paul, since we're talking about Paul, in chapter 15 of the first Corinthians, uh, if you scroll down uh, to verse. Well, I'll just read. For what I received, I passed on to you. Kind of the same thing he was saying to the Galatians. How can you get it so wrong? I told you the truth. Okay. Well, here it is. Here's the, here's the truth he passed on. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He appeared to Peter, then the 12, and then more than 500. So he died, buried, resurrected and we saw him alive now notice well where's the stuff about forgiveness of sins and belief faith well it's there 
wrote it for our salvation. Yes. It, so uh -huh. Paul just didn't write a paragraph explaining it, but but it's there. It, he died for our salvation. It, it just is missing the ver the uh, by grace through faith part. It, he doesn't use those terms there, but we know it's there. Okay, let me let me change gears and ask a slightly different question. Where is the gospel then in the verse? Now I'm going to change the share back to this document. Looking at the first five verses, can't find it. Here it is. First five verses. So in four, he made himself our son. Yeah, that, that's right. I'm, I'm looking for little snippet here, snippet there, snippet there. So we do see in verse four. What do we see in verse four? Who gave himself for our sins. And notice, I think it's complementary and rescues us. The implication is we need to rescue. We're drowning. We need somebody to throw the lifeline. Without the lifeline, we will die. So oh, it's rescue us from the present evil age. And and then the evil age. Who is the prince of the evil age? That's right. The devil. Satan, the devil. So we could even say this this little description here, it's, it's a little cryptic with the way he said, saved from our sins, saved from the power of the devil and the curse of the devil um, by his actions. And somehow all of this is wrapped up in the glory of God. Remember John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world, that's how it starts. A lot of people, I think, get the wrong idea about God the Father. They see him as a grumpy judge who wants to condemn you for your sins. And if it wasn't for Jesus who comes along all nice and sweet, uh, you would be condemned. That's, that's not what the Bible teaches. It was God's love that sent Jesus to die. So it's his will that this plan of salvation is in place. So we can honestly say God, God, our father is a loving father. He wants our salvation. He doesn't want your condemnation. He wants you saved. Uh, where else, what else do we see here? A um, couple things about See, finding the gospel here. Um, we got the raised part in verse uh, one, who raised him from the dead. Paul said, dead, buried, raised. So we've got the raised part in that verse. Um, okay. Anything else? Well, do you consider, for instance, what Cliff was saying in the pulpit today, our identity change in Christ, is that part of the gospel? I'm going to include that in our next. Uh, <laughs> I'm about to change the, to the question one more time okay. to what other doctrines can we see? Here? Okay, so we're, we're going to, so that, so yes, I would say at, at least you'd say that that was a fruit of the salvation it's a, a See, result to me the gospel is not good news unless it applied it's done something for me okay the for me part yeah, that's good it, it, we are it is notice paul is actually specific there he used our sins that's so it's not it's not it, it, it's, 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 Let's Let's try to get at, our sins. Yes. Let me try to get at this. I think it's important. 
when uh, Paul says in Ephesians that we stand holy and blameless before God. That's obviously not true. No matter how much our sins are forgiven, we are not holy and blameless until God has made us personally holy and blameless. We're not in the system until we become new creatures. Each one of us changes. We, the old is past and the new has come. Personally. That's Jesus. We're in, that and it's Jesus, Jesus comes as possible, but the change is in us. We have changed. We bear fruit now, which is acceptable to God, because we have changed. We were children of Satan. Our identity has changed. We are children of Because we're in Christ. Christ. Our, our identity has changed. I don't think we have completely changed. Is our sin nature still, is still in us? That's all. I, I'm So I'm with you halfway, maybe. It is true that we are declared righteous, and that's a 100% declaration. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit begins to work on us. And so over our lifetime, our sinfulness that persists will diminish as the, as the Spirit convinces us of this, that, that, that. We, we hopefully fight against sin. So. We are changed. We have a new heart. We want to be good. Whereas before, we were an enemy of God. What do you think about the identity change? Do you include that? That, that, that is definitely, that's a declared situation. We are declared children of God. Yeah. And that's an absolute so we declaration. Have changed. And, that, and that's not percentage. No. That's, that's 100%. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. I'm with you. Um, I'd like to add one more thought. What what other doctrines can we see in this? Now he's he's blasting. Paul is blasting about the gospel. But what else is here in this? Just five verses. Um, notice, for example, that we have the Trinity here, not not in the way we normally say it. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But notice that the very first part says, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul identifies both of these people as part of the Godhead. Now, the Holy Spirit's a little harder to see, but notice he's addressing the churches in Galatia. That's up at the top, to the churches in Galatia. Paul knows that he planted those churches. He saw the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the people. So the Holy Spirit was um, effective. Otherwise, those churches wouldn't exist in the first place. It doesn't refer to him by name, but he refers to him maybe by uh, his effect. Um, his sentence, verse three: "Grace and peace." The Jews had a had a standard greeting. They still do. Shalom. Shalom. All that means is, well, it's not all. That's, that's unfair. It's a, it's a good greeting. It is God's peace be with you. That's what shalom means. They will sometimes <clears throat> double it. Shalom, shalom. If a Jew says shalom, shalom, they what that means is eternal peace. Uh, that, that's how they qualify. They don't add the eternal adjective. They just double the shalom. And that means eternal peace. Now, notice that Paul, who claims to be an apostle, is giving you, the reader, grace and peace. Who gives grace and peace? God, God gives grace and peace. 
So Paul is expressing the power of the Godhead. Grace comes through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, forgiveness of sins. Peace comes because now I have a, I have a resolved, reconciled conscience. I, I no longer have to worry about my relationship with God. So that's peace. And, and Paul is not just saying, I hope you have these things. He's expressing them. He's giving them. That's the power of speaking the word of God. He means for you to have these things as a gift, not some hopeful pie in the sky thing. He, he, he means to express it. Um, other, anything else? Yeah, present evil time, does that mean until Christ comes again? Uh, is, yes, uh, that's true. Uh, we agree, though, that right now the devil does exist. Um, it, partly it's the devil, partly it's just our sinful nature. Yeah. And partly it's the culture we live in. Yeah. So you could refer to it as our culture, too. Yeah. They conspire against us. Our yeah. mind spar inspires. The culture we live in inspires against us, what you see on right. TV. Yeah. And the devil throwing his darts. They're all part of the evil age. And at the beginning, the calling. Yeah, let's get back to that. I, I, I do want to. Th this, I, I, I read the, the commentary, <laughs> of course, at the beginning. And the distinction Luther was making between men nor by man. Yes. I got uh, a little confused about yeah. that. Yeah. First of all, remember, you, to, to get the whole story, you have to read either the book of Acts or, or a little bit further down in here. Uh, Paul is, remember the story, is accosted on the road to Damascus by Jesus. He's literally blown off, knocked off his horse, off right, his horse. with a two by four, or whatever. I don't know how Jesus did it. He hit him. He was blinded by the light. <laughs> No way to say it. And, and he asks, uh, or, or Jesus first says, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? Yeah. And Paul says, who, who are you? Yeah. I'm Jesus. I'm yeah, Jesus. Who are you? I'm, Je I'm Jesus. <laughs> I'm Jesus. Oh. Because Paul was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. Right. So once Jesus identifies himself, as Jesus, uh, Paul realizes he's been persecuting the wrong person because he's he's experiencing this. And this episode is what Paul refers to as an apocalypse. We use the term apocalypse to mean end of times and destruction. <clears throat> well, we get the word from things like this. Paul was apocalypse. <laughs> he was changed. What? What was before and what's after are just completely different things. He was apocalypsed. Not in a destructive sense. Well, you could say his past was destroyed and his, his future he was new. He was blinded, too. Right? Yes, he was blinded. And he was told, uh, all Jesus told him to do, well, I should I don't want to belittle it. Because he says, by Jesus Christ, sent not from men. So, so. Paul says that Jesus Christ teaches him the gospel and sends him on his mission. Now, we do not see very many sentences of this process. In Luke, the book of Acts tells us a little bit of an interchange. So when did Jesus give Paul the details? We have to say, it it's not there. I can't I can't point to it. Now it, it could be that that Jesus works outside of time. I said that last week too. Paul, I don't know how much time Jesus had with Paul there while he's still kneeling in the dust on the road to Damascus. Um, all all the people who were with him said was well we heard the voice but we couldn't see anyone 
and and G and Paul doesn't explain where exactly you know where, where, what were the chapters and verses Jesus went through with him, but Paul says, "Eat, eat." Jesus taught me the gospel. No man taught me the gospel, mm. and he and Jesus gave me my mission to go to the Gentiles. No man gave me that. So that's why he means by man and man. The other thing about men is that today we have pastors and they're called in a process. And you could argue at least that men are involved, not just men, men and women, women human beings are involved in this process. We have a we have a committee that works up at the synod that helps people who are trying to discern whether they are called into ministry. Okay, and, 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 and they, I'm sure they believe that that whole process is controlled by the Holy Spirit, which is God, that, that's fine. But it is a human process cooperating with the Holy Spirit to decide whether that person should go to seminary and become a pastor. <laughs> So he, so that's the man and man from men nor by man, I think is is identifying either one of those. His point is specifically Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip, they did not teach me this. Jesus taught me this. His revelation. That's what he, he says it several times, a revelation from Jesus Christ. A revelation is simply an announcement. Jesus tells me the truth of the gospel and where I'm supposed to go and preach it. And therefore, no argument to Paul is, is relevant. You can't argue with him about anything. He got it right from the source. He, 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 I got it. I got it from God. So, so you can't. So, so we we see in Book of Acts the story of the Council in Jerusalem, chapter nine, and and it does turn out that Paul wins the argument, okay, about circumcision and uh, and other Jewish laws. But if the council had decided differently, we would have had a different story. But Paul would not have given in. He would not have conceded. It does turn out that they did concede. And so you have a resolution. Paul is supposed to go to the Gentiles and, and they do not need to adopt Mosaic law. Done deal. For some reason, this is weird. I had never really thought about it until looking at this Galatians commentary. It is odd that the Jewish believers apparently tried to maintain the Mosaic law for a time. Hmm. Paul was free, according to the Jew Jerusalem Council. They basically said, go, uh, we understand. You have, the, you have the gospel to the Gentiles, no Mosaic law, just go for it. And we'll stick with the Jews, the other disciples. So, what was their teaching like? They said they had the same gospel, but did they teach you have to follow kosher laws? Did they? I, I, yeah, I'm going to say that if they did, it didn't last long. <laughs> but that you can't tell. Because the, the, they say they had communion with the. They had communion. Now, okay, that's fair. That that's a. That is a violation of kosher laws. If you eat with an if you eat with a Gentile, you are breaking Mosaic law. Mm, right. So the fact that the early church had communion and Paul gave them a hard time in the same letter about P Peter tried to separate themselves from the Gentiles and the Jews and no no you, you can't do that. There is no Greek no slave uh, what is it um, no Jew no Greek no slave no free no man no woman. Okay, we all commune together. Wasn't it Peter that had the dream though that God yes, yes. said all these foods you can eat? 
That's right. Yeah. And it's not, it's not it's not unclean. Yeah. And then Peter so Peter was just like the I'm afraid it's one of the reasons I like Peter. He is inconsistent. He's just inconsistent. Yeah. He gets highs and lows. And and he he got that amazing message and he actually got it right then after that that vision. Um it was the is the name of the convert Cornelius in that case. So so he but Peter addressed the situation correctly in the case of Cornelius. Uh nothing makes you unclean. Okay. Then in the book of Galatians we have the account where Peter came to visit. And and while he was there by himself, he ate and conversed with the Gentiles, no problem. But in through the door walked some of the people from Jerusalem, the Judaizers, from James, it says. I don't know if they were really sent from James or they were just of the James party. It doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> matter. But anyway, as soon as they arrive, he withdraws. Huh. He backs up and starts acting like a good Jew, no huh. longer eats with the Gentiles. Huh. I guess they set up two separate tables. But it's it's more than that. It's not just eating. It's, it's how your foods are prepared. As I, I was joking about the hamburger. Yeah. In a in a Jewish kitchen, you've got, I think, two, two different sets of dishes. Huh. Dairy products are cooked with this stuff, and meat. And, and by the way, no ham, of course, no pork. But but beef is cooked over here, and also lamb. They'll, they'll eat lamb and goat. You divide your kitchen. You divide your eating. Um, that's just an example. Um, what else? Um, Still, the men and man confuses me because I read what Luther said, and it doesn't make any sense. So you don't you don't see it as uh, addressing. Um, so, well, he, we have we have a call process which includes human beings. Yeah, from men, nor by but but Luther made a distinction between the. I I I think the other piece is this stuff about who taught him this. The 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 teaching that. Paul is giving is divine. It is not man-made. Yeah. That's what I see there. It's not something man made up. Frankly, it's too confusing. If, it, <laughs> if you, no man would create the system. Right, right. But the, the distinction between from men nor by men. I'm with you. I'll yeah. think about it a little more if I can see if I can offer you some more help. I'll, I'll reread re Luther on that one sentence. One yeah. thing, we, we, when you get that document and look at it carefully, you'll notice that he he parses, he moves one, almost sometimes one word at a time mm -hmm. through through a sentence. Yeah. And and it's 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 amazingly detailed. The book of Galatians is six chapters long. You can easily read it in. I'm guessing 30 minutes, one sitting. Paul's commentary to the Galatians is four or five times that. Luther's. I'm sorry. Thank you. Luther's commentary of the Galatians is four or five times that length. It'll take you hours to read it. Um, <laughs> he wrote it in Latin. Did he write it in German too, or did he translate it? I don't know. I don't know. Back in those days, he they, he had some help with his um, production of his books and things. So probably it was created in German right away. I would I would imagine. Uh, it's a good commentary. I've heard I've heard people of different denominations. I've heard, I've, 